Hello and welcome to CIA Files, True Stories of U.S. Intelligence. I'm your host, Topher M. Ford, and sadly today, Brandon is not with me. Uh, that is my fault. Uh, we had actually recorded the intro for this episode together, but I foolishly deleted the file. Um, you know, I do stupid stuff every once in a while, um, and I did it. Brandon is not able to uh, record with me uh, at the moment just due to circumstances out of his control. So, you know, I figured I'd just jump in here, give you a quick intro, um, and just get right to it. This is a long episode anyway. It's longer than um, most of the episodes I think that we've done to this point. And it's an interesting one. Today we are telling the origin story of another key CIA individual, uh, and that's James Jesus Angleton. Um, we're going to go right up to the formation of the CIA, and uh, we're going to show how he got to where he ended up with the CIA. Um, we're going to cover uh, fascism, Italian fascism, and his <laughs> comfort with Italian fascism. And um, also, Angleton is the main person to bring, like, literature and uh, literary analysis into the CIA, which will become a big part of how the CIA operates um, as it gets going. So, anyway, I'm going to quit rambling, and uh, here's uh, Jim Angleton. We are not professing to tell you the complete story of these activities. We are professing to tell you the complete story that we know. These records that we've uncovered don't tell the story. This is CIA Files. They tell pieces of it. True stories of U.S. intelligence. Toward the end of the Second World War, many Americans had rather strong feelings about fascists, mostly that fascists were evil and tyrannical, fueled by hatred and a total disregard for human life. But there were some who didn't feel that fascists were all that bad. Some Americans thought that perhaps the fascists actually had some good points if you didn't get too hung up on the violent anti-Semitism. Jim Angleton fell solidly into the latter category. As a young man, he was intrigued by the ideology of fascism. When he grew up, Jim denounced fascism in all the appropriate meetings and hearings, but behind the scenes, he helped facilitate the migration of Nazis and Italian fascists into the service and protection of the United States government. James Jesus Angleton was born in Boise, Idaho on December 9, 1917 to James Hugh Angleton and Carmen Marino Angleton. Hugh met Carmen in Nogales, Arizona, where he was stationed as a member of the Idaho National Guard. Carmen was from Mexico, but had become a U.S. citizen by the time they met. In 1916, the two were married and returned to Idaho to start a family. Carmen gave her newborn son a Spanish middle name, Jesus, although James would hide his mother's heritage by adopting a different English middle name when he enlisted in the military. James was the first of four children born into a humble middle-class environment. At the time, Hugh worked as a salesman for National Cash Register Company. He rose through the corporate ranks over the next 10 years until, in 1927, he became the company's vice president and moved the family to Dayton, Ohio. James spent his formative years in public school, living the life of a typical middle-class kid. He enjoyed reading 
and he spent a great deal of time stomping through the woods near his home. He loved fly fishing and taught himself how to make his own fly lures. But James soon found himself thrust into a rather unique life. In 1933, his father purchased NCR's Italian subsidiary and moved the family to Italy to oversee his new business. Over the course of young James' childhood, his family had moved from the idyllic, if not mundane, American Midwest to the extravagant and exotic Milan. The Angletons wanted their children to become well-educated and well-traveled. They sent James, now a teenager, to Malvern College, an exclusive boarding school in Worcester, England. There, James picked up certain British affectations, including a slight accent and manner of dress. After high school, James attended the prestigious Yale University, where he studied English poetry. He became caught up in a growing literary movement emerging from Yale called the New Criticism. So what was this New Criticism movement? Well, their ideas came from the Explication de Texte of French literary studies. We'd call it close reading, which you'll probably be familiar with from elementary to high school English class. You read a sentence or paragraph and break it apart for meaning or symbolism. The New Critic's concerns when reading or when close reading were more about the aesthetics of the poem. Though quite French in the U.S., that was considered unacademic. Much like close reading high school students today, they looked for literary elements like paradox, ambiguity, and irony in their search for theme and the most accurate meaning of the text. However, their stance could be somewhat contradictory and all over the place. Even one of its members, Clint Brooks, described it as the snark, a fictional character itself indescribable. But the shortest explanation is probably that they believed the author's intent and the outside connections the words may have were meaningless. What mattered was on the page. They didn't care if the author used a word rooted in Latin or German or whatever was going on politically at the time. It's as if they were saying, it may be true that no man is an island unto himself, but a poem is, except when sometimes it isn't. James roomed with an aspiring poet, Reed Whitmore, who introduced him to the poetry of T.S. Eliot, whose poem Garantian would remain one of James' favorite poems for the rest of his life. Angleton discovered a passion for literature and poetry, especially that of past British masters, driven by the fresh interpretations of the new criticism. Imagine a man, very clever, but quite arrogant. This man is an American from an elite family. He's a poet and decides that England is simply culturally superior to the U.S. He converts to the Anglican Church, takes on an English accent, and moves to England becoming a subject of the crown. Now you're imagining T.S. Eliot. You might remember reading The Hollow Men, The Wasteland, or the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock in Senior Lit. Well, that was Eliot. He was also quite the literary critic. He wrote essays disparaging the romantics for being too into the sensual. He developed objective correlation, which in a simplistic way means writers use words that describe actions, and from those words, the reader understands a character's emotions. You don't have to read, John was sad, to know John was sad. You can read, John's eyes teared up. He looked down and let out a sigh. 
Additionally, Eliot argues if a writer describes emotions or individual actions representing those emotions exceed the circumstances, you know, like crying over spilled milk, then the writer is failing. In any event, Eliot's critical essays were an inspiration to the new criticism movement. Yeats, for his part, was a member of the Protestant elite Anglo-Irish. However, he was quite an Irish nationalist. He was a bit of a traditionalist and feared mob rule. Later in life, he became wary of democracy and leaned toward fascism, seeing it as a return to stability and communal responsibility. This pre-World War I to World War II literary crew had a, had a lot of fascist sympathizers. He spent much of his life traveling and writing. He studied Hinduism and was quite into that sort of spirituality and theosophy. He worked with Ezra Pound. They spent some time living and working together in the early 1900s. Pound, too, had a fascist bent. Yates was appointed to the Senate of the Irish Free State. He started his political career as a pluralist, but later in his career began confronting the Catholic Church and its political actions in Ireland, specifically their attempt to outlaw divorce. Yates' poems are packed full of symbolism, metaphor, and imagery. He was a nationalist, traditionalist, elitist, and spiritualist. He was a collection of seemingly contradictory traits, and his poetry, full of literary elements, was perfect for the type of analysis the new criticism movement craved. Angleton also discovered literary critic William Epson, whose work Seven Types of Ambiguity would greatly influence Angleton much later in life when he became the head of U.S. counterintelligence efforts. Seven Types of Ambiguity would serve as a sort of blueprint for Angleton's approach to rooting out enemy spies. The new criticism that Angleton treasured was a powerful method, not merely for its insights into poetry, but for its implicitly conservative worldview. It was not value-free. On the contrary, its proponents would argue vigorously that it was a method deeply rooted in a particular set of values— a method in the final analysis for promulgating those values. The elevated strictures of the new criticism that exalted his favorite poets would prove formative for Angleton. He would come to value coded language, textual analysis, ambiguity, and close control as the means to illuminate the amoral arts of spying that became his job. Literary criticism led him to the profession of a secret intelligence. Poetry gave birth to a spy. One of Angleton's English professors, Maynard Mack, introduced young James to the work of contemporary poet Ezra Pound, who at that time happened to be living as an expatriate in nearby Rapallo, Italy. After his freshman year, Angleton returned home to Milan with a newfound passion for literature. Upon his return, he harangued the American embassy there until they gave him Pound's address. Angleton wrote the poet twice, presenting himself as the photo editor of the Yale Literary Magazine, which, in fact, didn't print photographs. Angleton asked Pound if they could meet, saying he wanted to get some photos of Pound for the magazine. Pound agreed, and Angleton traveled to his home in Rapallo. There, the young and impressionable Angleton took photos of Ezra in his apartment while doting over the master poet's words. The two exchanged letters often, with Angleton offering to help Pound's literary career while soliciting new poems from him. Aside from poetry, the two also discussed politics. Ezra Pound was an enthusiastic supporter of Benito Mussolini's Italian fascist movement happening at the time. Hitler considered Mussolini something of a role model. Despite that, it wasn't set in stone that Italy and Germany would be allies. There were many flavors of fascism, with Nazism being one kind. 
for Mussolini's part, he was more favorable to the religious fascism of Austria's Engelbert Dolphus. England diplomatically was trying to drive a wedge between Hitler and Mussolini. Siding with Italy in World War I had worked out for Italy. Why not in round two? Dolphus was assassinated by Nazis in '34, and Mussolini drifted over to Hitler due to Hitler's support of Mussolini's invasion of Ethiopia. Dolphus's successor, Kurt Schuschnigg, was left isolated and eventually gave in to Hitler's demands, which led to the union of Austria with Germany. Mussolini planned to basically run the British and French out of North Africa, the Mediterranean, and the Middle East. Hitler and Mussolini competed with each other in creating unwanted fronts. The, the agreement between them um, expected that there would be a war against the British and French. And that was not to occur until '43. So Italy would have time to prepare. Well, after the invasion of Poland, Italy went along. They made some initial advances into France and in North Africa. Um, but then uh, Mussolini, he decides to invade Greece, which was leaning fascist, so diplomatically quite unwise. Also unwise because the Italian invasion failed. Hitler sent German troops in, and it upset the political landscape, leading to the German invasion of Yugoslavia. So both German and Italian soldiers were getting dragged into fronts not necessary to their overall war aims, the ultimate of which was arguably the invasion of Russia, which served no real interest for Italian imperial aims. Uh, but Hitler got as he gave when the Japanese attacked the U.S., and he felt obliged to declare war on the U.S. in response. As far as the, the U.S. and its feelings toward Italy before the war, it had no special negative feelings, even towards Mussolini, much less Italy, and they were high on isolationism. But after the Italian invasion of Ethiopia, their relations began to strain. And of course, once the Axis declared war on the U.S., the U.S. wasn't happy with the government of Italy. It should be noted, though, that the Italian king was not thrilled with Mussolini and at the first chance switched to the Allied side. The U.S. and Italy were technically only at war from 41 to 43 and much of that was fought in North Africa against Germans of the Africa Corps. When Americans and allies arrived in Italy, there were Italian partisans eager to support them and fight alongside them. So for the allies, it wasn't so much a war against Italy as against the Italian fascist movement. That continued on until 45. After the war, Pound was put on trial for radio broadcasts he'd made during the war, extolling the virtues of Mussolini and fascism while denouncing the United States and the West. His writer friends pressured him into claiming insanity, which he did successfully. Pound spent several years in a Minstel Institute before being released, and while he did officially renounce fascism, he continued to express far-right sentiments after his release. When the United States joined the war, Angleton was rejected by the Selective Service for military duty, likely because he'd previously had bouts with tuberculosis. So instead, he applied to law school at Harvard. But Angleton had graduated near the bottom of his class at Yale and so was rejected by the prestigious university. Luckily for Angleton, his friend, Norman Holmes Pearson, carried some influence at Harvard and wrote a letter on Angleton's behalf, insisting that he'd be an excellent student. Harvard reversed their decision, and Angleton was admitted. This wouldn't be the only time that Pearson would affect the course of Angleton's life. 
Pearson would go on to recruit Angleton into the world of intelligence. As a matter of fact, Pearson would also go on to help found the Central Intelligence Agency. Pearson, then 32 years old, surely qualifies as the most improbable spymaster in American history. An assistant literature professor from a prosperous New England family, Pearson had few obvious qualifications for a life of deception and intrigue. He was a genteel man, of unobtrusive appearance, who walked with a limp left over from a spinal injury in childhood. He was also a founding spirit of the global enterprise of espionage, propaganda, and violence known as the Central Intelligence Agency. In 1943, Angleton proposed to his girlfriend, Cicely Dautremont, despite his parents' objections. Cicely was the daughter of a wealthy couple from Duluth, Minnesota, who'd relocated to Tucson, Arizona. She first met Angleton while on a date with one of his friends, James made quite an impression on Cicely then, where she first saw him standing in front of an El Greco painting, View of Toledo. She later recalled, If anything went together, it was James in the picture. I fell madly in love at first sight. I'd never met anyone like him in my life. He was so charismatic. It was as if the lightning in the picture had suddenly struck me. He had an El Greco face. It was extraordinary. James was also drafted into the army that year. He chose to begin as a lowly enlisted soldier, despite the fact that he might have used his father's connections to join as an officer. He enlisted as James Hugh Angleton, Jr., abandoning his Mexican heritage. James and Cicely married while he was in army training, then she moved back to Tucson to stay with her family while he readied himself for war. Pearson, who'd gotten Angleton accepted to Harvard, was part of the Office of Strategic Services, or OSS. He arranged for James to join the OSS after basic training. Angleton traveled to Maryland, where he engaged in OSS spy training. There, he trained alongside the men who would, along with himself, go on to shape the path and methodology of the Central Intelligence Agency including Frank Wisner, Bill Colby, and Dick Helms. After OSS training in Maryland, the espionage acolytes were sent to New York, where they were taught specialized extra-legal skills from narcotics agent George Hunter White. Angleton and his cohort then shipped off to England for even more training at Bletchley Park, where British forces were intercepting and cracking coded communications from Axis powers. Bleachley Park was a mansion conveniently located between the most famous universities of England and London. It was bought to house British intelligence code-breaking operations. It had thousands of employees in and around the premises. Many were mathematicians and translators. Three-fourths were women. These geniuses broke many codes. Their work in mathematics led directly to the creation of the first electronic computers. To communicate with allies like the Americans, the British set up special liaison units. There was one with each major command. MI6 would communicate with a liaison officer who would give the Allied counterpart written information. And after the counterpart read it, discussed it, then the paper portion was destroyed. At Bletchley Park, Angleton met another man who would play a large role in his life, Harold Kim Philby. Philby taught the new recruits the ins and outs of the Allied intelligence efforts. The two men would become close friends. Pearson and Philby taught Angleton everything they knew about espionage and counterintelligence. He taught Angleton how to run double-agent operations, to intercept wireless and mail messages, and to feed false information to the enemy. Angleton would prove to be his most trusting friend. Angleton had found a calling and a mentor. Pearson brought Angleton in on one of the Allies' biggest and most important secrets, the code-breaking effort known as Project Ultra. 
The work to decipher the Enigma machine codes was called Project Ultra because it was ultra-secret, the most secret of security levels. The project was successful due to mistakes Germans made in security measures and discipline, as opposed to weaknesses of the code or the Enigma device itself. If the Germans knew their code had been broken, they could have easily fixed those mistakes. It should be noted that Polish intelligence had broken the Enigma code in 32, um, but the Germans made their code much more complex in 39. Not having the resources to break the updated complexities, the Poles turned over what they knew to the British and French, which was invaluable to them in breaking the updated code. Angleton also learned the art of doubling, wherein captured German spies were compelled to return to their leaders with false information. In this way, Allied espionage efforts influenced the Nazis to move their troops away from Normandy in 1944, allowing Allied forces to land there and push to Paris. Angleton was eventually put in charge of counterintelligence efforts in Italy, which he managed from OSS offices in England. He showed little concern for danger while existing under the threat of Nazi V-2 rockets and buzz bombs. His task was to ferret out members of the Nazi foreign spy network who were left behind in Allied-occupied Italy. The Sicha Hitzdietz is probably better known as the SD. Was the military intelligence of the SS. It more or less existed even before the war. Remember, the SS was the militarized branch of the Nazi party. Even before they were in power, uh, they also kind of worked like the political commissars in the Soviet Union to root out party members who didn't believe in the true Nazi faith. You know, they weren't the right kind of Nazi. You know, the ones that would oppose Hitler or Himmler. SD members also infiltrated police departments and law enforcement agencies in Germany. Now, there is a claim today that right-wing organizations are doing the same thing in the United States. Anyway, once the Nazis got power, the SD grew in influence. It was led by Reinhard Heydrich, who also led the Gestapo, and uh, he's the man who eventually helped coordinate the Holocaust. It existed in parallel to the Abwehr, the regular German Army's military intelligence branch. The SD had the goal of being able to keep tabs on every resident of the Reich, a goal that the burning of the Reichstag gave them an excuse to carry out. In their fight against terrorism, the SD created an index file system meant to create a file on every person. The SD was instrumental in the takeover of Austria. They were prepared with files on potential resistance leaders. They funded and distributed propaganda, engaged in clandestine attacks, intimidated opponents, and when German troops invaded Austria, they had an arrest list ready. They were involved in faking Polish attacks on Germans, the most famous being at the radio station in Gliwice, then a German border town with Poland. SD soldiers dressed some prisoners up in Polish uniforms and killed them making sure they were shot. My understanding is they were killed by lethal injection first. They um, then dressed themselves up as Polish soldiers and attacked the radio station. They left the dead bodies, which were then used as evidence of a Polish attack. Just like they worked in parallel with military intelligence, you know, but they had their own agenda with their own chain of command going up to Hitler, they frustrated the efforts of the Reich Foreign Ministry because they reported their information directly to Hitler without consulting them. 
And often Hitler would make decisions based on their intelligence and or recommendations without going to the more official branch of government. They were also instrumental in the Holocaust in a way similar to the Gestapo. The Gestapo, however, was the secret police of the state. The SD had more of a party loyalty and military focus. They were also over the Einsatzgruppen, which was in short military units organized for the express purposes of genocide. They went into areas occupied by the Reich and searched for Jews and anyone else who had been prescribed. Um, you know, of course, partisans as well. And when they found them, the fate was very often death. President Roosevelt had declared that Italian surrender must be complete and unconditional. Angleton, being less concerned with fascism and already worried about the growth of communism, proposed a plan to work with former members of the Italian military the Allies had just been fighting, using them to eliminate the last remnants of fascism from the Italian government, but also using them to counter communist expansion into the area. U.S. leaders were suspicious of this plan, as they still considered Soviet Russia an ally. The plan was supported by Alan Dulles, though, who was also preoccupied with the threat of communism. In May of 1945, just two weeks after Mussolini was killed and hanged from a streetlight, Angleton returned to Milan, where he met with a friend, an Italian naval officer named Captain Carlo Rezio, and a friend of Rezio, Prince Junio Valerio Borghese. Junio was the second son of Prince Sulmona, Though Junio was technically a patrician and not a prince, he was given the courtesy title of prince by the press. During the war, he was a submarine commander who pioneered what would be described today as Navy SEAL operations. For this reason, his detractors called him the Frog Prince. His success and use of two-man submarines for surprise raids led to awards and his promotion to command Naval Sabotage Flotilla, the Decima Flotilla. When Italy surrendered in 43, his unit was disbanded. Many joined the Allies, but he defected to Mussolini's puppet state in the north. Working with German Kriegsmarine, he revived the Decima Flotilla. It was stationed in northwest Italy, but he received word that the Brits gave Tito, the Yugoslavian communist partisan commander, the green light to invade northeast Italy. So he relocated his forces there to resist the invasion. Much of the Italian, Slovenian, slash Croatian, slash Yugoslav border was historically disputed. Well, possession being nine tenths of the law, perhaps he wanted as much in Italian hands as possible until it could be surrendered to the Americans. However, his defense line was well within traditional Italian borders. Nonetheless, 80% of his force died defending the line until the Allies arrived. James Angleton of the OSS found him, dressed him in an American uniform, and drove him to Rome for interrogation. He was tried and found guilty of treason, but not of war crimes, hmm. and served four years. He went on to write about his exploits and work with neo-fascist groups, writing defenses of the ideology. He was also involved in a coup attempt that fell apart, after which he fled to Spain, where he spent the rest of his days. His death is a bit mysterious. He died soon after eating a meal 
than clenching his stomach. Hmm. Those Roman politicians in poison. Borghese, at the time, was supposed to be leading his military and covering the Nazi retreat from Italy. The Nazi plan was to destroy everything useful as they fled, including bridges and ports. Angleton convinced Borghese not to enact this scorched earth retreat, leaving Italy's vital infrastructure intact in return for easy treatment after the war. Angleton hid Borghese from British intelligence, who were looking to interrogate him for information before handing him over to the partisans for execution. Thus, Angleton established his lack of discomfort in working with fascists. Angleton later had Borghese's arrest record falsified so that the British didn't discover him. Angleton later helped Borghese migrate to the United States. After the war, Angleton was directed to monitor the political situation in Italy, especially the activity of communists who were rising in popularity. He was also directed to gather evidence of war crimes for the upcoming trials to determine the extent of Axis crimes against humanity. Angleton, however, was more focused on communism. Two former prominent Nazis, Eugen Dahlmann and Eugen Winner, escaped from prison and fled to Milan. When Angleton found out, he had them found and put up in a safe house with a third Nazi, Walter Rauf. Walter Rauf was an assistant to Reinhard Heydrich, the famed leader of the SD and Gestapo, as well as Holocaust organizer. They had served together in the Navy. Uh, Rauf was placed in charge of the SD in Norway for a bit, um, but in his work with um, Heydrich, Ralph worked with a uh, chassis maker to design a gas chamber van. The exhaust led straight to an airtight back. The idea is they would put people in the back, uh, 20 or more, and then drive to the burial site. By the time they got there, the people in the back would have suffocated to death. Uh, he never really showed remorse for his actions. Uh, he explained that um, he was just helping keep the soldiers from being upset by shooting people. I mean, he probably deserves his own episode. I mean, he, he goes on to be involved in the North Africa campaign, terrorizing the Jewish population there. He was put in charge of the SD in northern Italy in 43. Uh, with the help of a Catholic bishop, he escaped Europe. Uh, he worked for Syrian intelligence. Uh, it's rumored he worked for the Mossad, um, back to German intelligence, and lived out his days in Chile. He enlisted these men in the fight against Soviet Russia, ensuring that none of them would face any consequences for their roles in Nazi war crimes. When the CIA was formed in 1947, Angleton returned to Washington to help work on the agency's first large mission, an effort to influence the upcoming Italian election and keep communist politicians from gaining political power. Under Angleton's leadership, the CIA funneled money to conservative politicians. As we know, nation-building is a complicated business. Uh, Italians were very much divided by the wounds of war. The last two years of the war basically doubled as a civil war, I mean, if not the whole thing. After the war officially ended, partisans settled old scores. The future of a stable Italy able to resolve its problems democratically was in doubt. Much of Eastern Europe had fallen to communism, and now with the elections in 48, it looked like Italy would elect a socialist majority. There were a number of parties and coalitions, but the two main ones were the right-wing party Christian Democracy and a coalition of left-wing parties called the Popular Democratic Front, and it was a coalition of the communist and socialist parties. The U.S. was afraid a victory for the Popular Democratic Front would lead to a communist takeover of Italy. 
So they directed millions towards the Christian Democracy Party's campaign efforts. It came in many forms. Disinformation campaigns about communist leaders like, you know, releasing fake correspondence. Um, money directed at politicians, like given to them directly to pay for their campaign expenses. Um, the publication and the distribution of pamphlets on the problems a communist government would bring. Radio Free Europe did stories on the cautionary tales of the evils of communism. It's also believed that the Kremlin gave millions to the Communist Party of Italy as well. If so, the U.S. got the best return on its investment and election interference as the Christian Democracy Party won. The conservatives won with the CIA's help. As the world began to recover from the war, Western powers grew more and more concerned about the Soviet Union's growing influence and political power in Europe. The U.S. and Great Britain decided to work together to fight the rising tide of communism. Angleton went back to Washington, where he would be working with British intelligence on this matter. And the British sent one of their finest to Washington to lead coordination efforts there. Angleton's friend and mentor, Harold Kim Philby. All right, now we're set up for some good, juicy stuff. Um, we're back in the States. Jim Angleton has earned himself a key position in the brand new CIA. He's back to Washington, D.C., and he's coordinating with British intelligence. They've sent their best to be the liaison. And who is their best? Kim Philby. And what do we know that they did not know at the time? Kim Philby was communist. And, yeah, it gets exciting, at least for me, but I'm a nerd for this stuff. Anyway, thanks again for listening. Uh, please remember, reviews, ratings, those help us. You can, um, if you need more information on the episodes, you can visit our website, www.ciafiles.net. Or on Facebook, it's uh, facebook.com slash CIA Files, Twitter and Instagram at CIA Files Podcast. And uh, thanks for listening. We'll be back soon. <laughs> <laughs>